Brothers and sisters, I am absolutely certain that you will agree with me that it has been a wonderful pleasure to have Brother Daniel Sidlick from Bethel with us this uh, fine special assembly day, hasn't it? Now, Brother Sidlick will be returning back to uh, Bethel soon. Would you like him to ask, would you like to ask Brother uh, Sidlick to please convey our warm Christian love and greetings to the Bethel family upon his return? He waves an acknowledgement back there. Okay, I'm sure he'll be happy to do that. Brothers, now we can look forward to his final talk entitled, Fit to be trusted with the good news. Brother Sidlick, please. Hear those announcements. I wish they would continue. But it's a real privilege to be here with your brothers and experience your warm family relationship. You've been a very loving people. It makes me want to talk to you like an old grandfather or a Dutch uncle. <laughs> and we just begin to reflect on the blessings that are ours. How wonderful it is to know the true living God, Jehovah, the maker and the creator of heaven and earth and the giver of life to man. That boggles the imagination that we could have a relationship with God that way. And uh, what a privilege it is to be entrusted with the good news of God's kingdom. Just to reflect on those things should make us feel great, frankly, brothers. To think that we are a part of a government blessed by God that will solve all mankind's ills and take this earth and turn it into a paradise and people here will live and health and happiness for all eternity, that too boggles the imagination. But it's true, it's coming from the word of God, and his words do not return unto him void. Now, the words of the Apostle Paul, when he reflected, reflected upon his association or relationship with God, he said, I praise my God, Jehovah, and I glorify my ministry, this takes reflection, it takes feeling. For us, sometimes when we're all alone, we ought to do this, meditate upon our association, the relationship with God, and see if the inner motions and being of our inside does not cry out to God and pray. I praise my God, Jehovah, and when we think of being privileged to understand his purposes and how this relates to humankind and to God's purpose, oh, he says, why, he says, I glorify my ministry. Just to think who we are, and yet we have these great privileges extended to, to us. Paul reflect on this because it's a marvelous declaration when he says this is fine and acceptable in the sight of our Savior God whose will is that all sorts of men should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. Whose will is, the will of God is that people live and not die. And that's something marvelous, brothers, a beautiful declaration to think that this is the will of God that man live and not die. And of course, God is not going to force him to live. This is, he, man is a free moral agent, and it should come as something spontaneous from within him. But this is the will of God. And we're talking about here, and what we're talking about here is the possibility, the potential of having a close relationship with God, the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. We're not talking so much about a good service record or good work record, which is nice to have, I suppose, 
we don't let Bethel get very much an opportunity to go out and serve us anymore. We're glad you do. But the fact of the matter is, we're talking more of a relationship, a loving relationship with the living God, the God who is love. Do we understand just quite what that means? To give you an idea, there is a sister by the name of Minnie who was a pioneer, and she stopped her pioneering. She said pioneering was a little too much, too demanding for her, and uh, she wanted to live a little. She had a husband, too, children and a full-time job. That should have occupied her quite much, and perhaps it did. But she said she didn't have the time that she would like in life to be able to relax and do the things that she wanted to do. And so she left the pioneer work. And many of our brothers feel the same way. Sometimes we get weary and tired and kind of involved with our own ideas, disgruntled at mind, and we come to these conclusions, whether they're good or bad, immaterial and God be judged. But the fact of the matter is we do have these ideas. But one day Minnie's child became very seriously ill and she went into a panic, that is the mother did. She didn't, not only she turned to doctors, but here was one time she turned to God. There were some hard searching moments when her daughter was so ill. And so when the child became a little better. She breathed a sigh of relief. But she said this taught her something, that it was a big lesson that a relationship with God meant more to her than all the wealth in the world. She loved her child and she loved her God and she knew how much she needed God now. And the truth of the matter is she wanted to trust God and do more for him if she possibly could. Now she had an entirely different outlook about life, about her relationship with her family and with the people around her. But brothers, must we wait for some great tragedy to strike us before we can learn lessons like this? Sometimes we have to be driven to something. Usually people don't come to do the truth unless there's a great tragedy in the family, someone has died, or there's an accident, or someone is ill, and this drives them to think beyond themselves. Not to say that this is bad, but the fact of the matter is, could we do this a little earlier? Prepare for moments of this nature. We need a relationship to experience the warmth of our God. The prophet Isaiah was a very remarkable prophet. Frankly, he was an aristocrat in the kings of the court, in the courts of the kings. He's a highly educated man. If you ever read the book of Isaiah, you're held spellbound by the illustrations, the thoughts, and the ideas that he expresses and the way he expresses them, that's something to see. Now, Isaiah talks about his relationship with God and he puts it down in writing in the 41st chapter of the book of Isaiah. Look the way God speaks to him and he speaks to God. Here in the 41st chapter of the book of Isaiah, chapter nine, Jehovah speaks in this case and he calls him, but he says, but you, O Israel, are my servant, you, O Jacob, my chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Notice here, it's not only a servant, but here the relationship to the nation of Israel was one of friendship. You, whom I have taken hold of from the extremities of the earth, and you, whom I have called, even from the remote parts of it. And so I said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you. 
and I have not rejected you. Now here is God talking to his people, and he puts them on a very singular basis, as if he's talking eyeball to eyeball to each one of you. Notice in verse 10 he says, Do not be afraid, for I am with you. He called them earlier a friend. Now he says, don't be afraid. Be conscious of the fact that God is with you. I am with you. Do not gaze about, for I am your God. I will fortify you. I will really help you. I will really keep fast hold of you with my right hand of righteousness. Now, notice the last word there is righteousness. And the fact of the matter is, unless we have an inclination to righteousness, we have no friendship with God. It is our righteous inclinations for righteousness and judgment or justice are the foundation of God's throne. Unless we have an inclination, a bent to doing what is right and to, it, to doing what is just, this friendship does not come to us from God. You want to look at verse 13 there in the 41st chapter. For I, Jehovah your God, am grasping, grasping your right hand. I, Jehovah, am grasping your right hand. The one saying to you, do not be afraid. I myself will help you. If we could only visualize that, brother. Thinking Jehovah grabbing you by your right hand. What reason do you have for fear? What reason do you have that you will not receive the help that you need or want or desire? But those that right after that in verse 14, the humorous statement, do not be afraid, you were. <laughs> Is that nice? You were. Jacob, you men of Israel, I myself will help you, is the utterance of Jehovah. Even your repurchaser, the Holy One of Israel, look, I have made you a threshing sledge, a new threshing instrument having double-edged teeth. You will tread down the mountains and crush them, and the hills you will make just like the chaff. You will winnow them, and a wind itself will carry them away, and a windstorm itself will drive them different ways, and you yourself will be joyful in Jehovah. In the Holy One of Israel, you will boast about yourself. Get this, it's in this grand relationship. The great potential is given you to do grand and glorious things, living and being associated with the true and living God, Jehovah. This is something that we ought to reach out for, brothers. Frankly, worshiping is hardly anything without it. And sometimes it's, it's a chore, lest we get to feel that we are working and being in a relationship with the true and living God. We live in a world where public cynicism seemingly knows no bounds. Very cynical generation. And sometimes it creeps in even in us. We say, oh, why don't you show me? I don't really don't believe it. We humble it to ourselves to that extent. But you'd be surprised. Trust in God persists. Nevertheless, but it's not a priority. People, even here in the land of Christendom, talk about God. We have Bible belts. Hard to witness in, but they love God, they say. And in a recent Newsweek survey, 54% of the adults said they prayed to God every day. You take every other person prays to God every day. I hardly believe it, really. <laughs> I wonder myself how on God's earth to whom do they pray and what sort of prayers do they pray. You know, my 29% of them said they pray more than once a day. 87% said they believe God answers prayers at least some of the time 
and an astounding 86 percent said that they accept God's failure to grant their prayers. In other words, they pray, and what they pray for, they're expecting God not to listen anyway. And you can hardly blame them. They might be praying for Mercedes and Lewis, whatever else. They usually they pray for very physical things, and God is looking to improve their hearts and minds and their will and strengthen them and renew them from within and not from without so much. They themselves will renew themselves without once they get straightened up on the inside. So, we see here that the report shows that they have a lot who, a lot of so-called believers out there in the field. But there is no warm, loving relationship as a a father has with his child. So it's one thing to talk about your child, but it's another thing to put your arm around your child, to squeeze him and tell him you love him. And then for the child to talk about the father and say, my, oh, I have a wonderful father, beautiful father, and then when he runs home, leaps into the lap of his father and hugs. Therein you find is where there is a relationship. In this day and age, when you walk and look at the families, families, the children hardly know who the father is. There is no running up and squeezing them. And they're usually rather frightful, frankly, in this day and age when it comes to family relationships. But sad to say, as a people, we ourselves, brothers, fluctuate in a similar way in our faith and outlook with our God, Jehovah. We find one day we're so strong we can tear down mountains and uproot trees with our strength and our faith in Jehovah. The next day, woo, all the way down here somewhere. And then something comes along and up we go again. We're threshing the doors and we're talking to people. And we come home and our face goes gloom. Oh, we're down in the dumps and we're filled with all kinds of things. And sometimes even doubts fill our minds and hearts. As James says, he who doubts, let that man know that he is like a wave of sea being tossed about by wind. Let, that not, let not that man think that he will receive a single thing from Jehovah. For he is a very indecisive man. When we have a relationship with God, this is such a sacred thing, frankly, that we should be very, very strong and cherish it. Find our strength in it. To be trusted, brothers, is a greater compliment than to be loved. God is love, and love is trusting. You want to just see your own relationships with your brothers. Brother comes along and says, Listen, I need a a thousand dollars. Whoops, wait a minute. Should I trust him with a thousand? That's just money, rags. It's not much even in this day and age. But already your relationship begins to quiver over something as simple as that. You find that your trust is not that great and you may be smart and not doing it. You see. But the fact of the matter is, love is a perfect bond to union. And that union is held together by trust, and trust is evidence of God's love, and it is evidence of your love toward an individual. If you love them enough, you will trust them, as to the extent that you love them. Trust and love go hand in hand, and they're joined together by Holy Spirit, which is from God. What we're talking about is a relationship that is warm, loving and affectionate. It's just not something superficial over the surface of things. One of our
our favorite scriptures in the Bible in which we quote so often is located in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 7. And some of us had it on our ear text or wherever we have them around here. And we should remember that text or memorize it to heart. Trust in Jehovah with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Jehovah and depart from that which is bad. And so here we're called upon to trust not to be wise in our own ways. Because after all, God knows more and is greater than we are. Greater even than what's in our heart. So trusting in Jehovah is such a beautiful thing. It is filled with feelings. It has nothing to do with facts and figures. It has to do with a relationship, a binding relationship. A long time ago, well, not so long ago, rather, it's an old time minister, missionary is what I want to call it. Maybe it was a long time ago. But the fact of the matter is that this brother was going house to house. Now notice, he, he tells us that he was very active as a missionary in the service. And he is one of those guys that never misses meetings. And he reads his Bible directly and daily. And, uh, but, here he goes and he is going like so many of us going in service through the motions. And not really being propelled from a, a motivated desire to want to praise the living God. So here he is in service and he enters this house of an unbeliever and on the wall is a plaque. Trust in Jehovah. And he says it just about blew his brain. Here he is, a believer, and there's a sign, something that he should be doing in his not, and this is hanging in an unbeliever's house. And then what he says, the rest of the day, I couldn't think of anything else but to trust in Jehovah. The brother was 21 years old at the time. And today he's 94, and he says he still looks back at that moment in life. He made those words his golden life. That is what was missing, he says in his service, in his relationship. He went and did things without really feeling the nearness of the living God and what he was doing. Since then, his life, he said, has been enriched with the fruitage of having trusted in Jehovah. And God gave him plenty to, to do to trust him. So, what these words did to him it made God come alive in his life. He was not only a God now, but a father. Someone he could relate to. God was someone who could be trusted, dependent upon. He became a living God. And frankly, when he felt great, this God created a joy in him. Someone you could get to know and to love someone you could speak to, and someone you felt was your friend. One day, though, now, as he was walking along in the field, he saw a butterfly. And he said that he wanted to learn to trust in Jehovah by observing nature. So now he sees this butterfly. You ever try to catch one, you'll realize it's not that easy. And he was observing this butterfly, and he says, I wonder how does this fragile creature make it, stay alive in this day and age? How does it survive from day to day? And that's primarily our problem so much. When you read Matthew, the sixth chapter, we worry about such little things. And so he's thinking about, how does this butterfly make it? After all, it must not be easy for him either, you know. So one day, there was this terrible wind and rainstorm. A tempestuous night, 
all night lightning, thunder, rain, wind. Where will this fragile butterfly hive to survive? How does he make it through the night? The storm arrives in all its fury. Buildings collapse, trees are uprooted, and crash to the earth. Rivers overflow their banks, bridges tumble into the water, houses float down streams. Where is this butterfly? The butterfly is kept safe by him who created it. It is safe under a broad leaf so that when the sun comes out the next day and warms that leaf, and energizes the wings of the butterfly. He where here he's out, flickering around. The whole world comes crash. But there's this butterfly, fragile creature. Isn't that something to comprehend? Right down now, this year we've had some terrible weather storms. Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Some areas you might want to be interested to know that. None of our people were killed in it. There were some homes that were destroyed and the brothers are taking care of that. Only one kingdom hall was slightly damaged. But the fact is there, there are some real terrible storms. In Italy, for example, they have had an earthquake shake that nation from stem to stern. And there are constant trembles. Lo and behold, none of our brothers have been injured. We got news of that, which is good to hear. Somebody's taking care of us. Really. And yet it almost sounds superstitious, doesn't it? To think that way. When are we going to transfer this idea of superstition to actual faith? That we do have a God who cares for us, who believes, and wants to strengthen us. Somehow we're almost afraid to believe that way. Now, from this the brother learned to trust in Jehovah by observing how Jehovah protects life around us. Sometimes I look at an audience like this and I say, look how calm they are. They sit here and if they only knew of all the violence and turmoil around them, if they only understood what a fragile balance keeps us alive, we perhaps all of us would be frustrated. Because here's the cycle of air. Whoever generates this air is what we need to breathe. In a few seconds of not breathing air, we're all laying flat on the ground. And yet, here sits so calmly as this, my, we got the whole wide world in our hands. But it's God who takes care of us. The Apostle Paul says we live and move and breathe and have our being in the hands of God. Acts is the 17th chapter. It's a beautiful thing to think, brothers, because we begin to think outside of ourselves and know not only inside, as if we are the most important thing on the face of the earth. But we can learn to trust and have a relationship with Jehovah but not only by observing creation, but by studying the Word of God and learning and drawing lessons from the Word of God that apply to us individually. For example, there were these 5,000 people, or more people, perhaps closer to six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 people following Jesus, and they followed Him for three days, and Jesus said, it's about time these people go home. And then he said, it's not right to send them home without feeding them. And so he turns to Philip and he says, Philip, how much do we have to feed Philip? Woo, 7,000 people. What does it take? He says, we've got a couple of loaves of bread. But well, you're not going to feed all, all these thousands of people. We're not even a crumb of peace with the enemy enough, you see. So then the young one says, listen, we've got a couple of fishes. Or, or we've got some pennies here. But we don't have enough. Jesus was teaching them a lesson. They still didn't understand who he was in relationship to God. 
And so he deliberately posed this question to them so they could understand that when people are hungry, it is God who feeds them and not man. The truth of the matter is, this was the lesson out in the desert with the children of Israel where there were five million of them, three to five, out there. There was nothing to eat. God provided manna for them. But when Jesus was on earth, the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus, what will you give us? They said, our forefathers gave us manna to eat. Notice how they phrased that. It's in John the sixth chapter. Jesus said, nuts. Your forefathers gave you nothing. It's my God Jehovah that gave you that man. And so you read in the book of John there, and in the book of Exodus 16, 15, from where Jesus quoted it is, bread that Jehovah has given you for food. But they got it all twisted around, thinking that Moses gave them this food. Moses could hardly keep himself alive. You see, what is he going to do with three to five million people? This is our problem. We're looking at things so physically all the time as if we are the big things when we are next to nothing greater. Wish to God we were big. We do different things upon the face of this earth than what we're doing. Jesus said, I am with you all the days, even to the end of the system of things. When he spoke about Moses, he said, Jehovah gave them garments that didn't wear out. He gave them sandals that didn't re need repair. He didn't give them wine, he said. They didn't need wine. He gave them bread that kept them alive. We've got to make it right evaluations, right priorities in life to really enjoy life. Jehovah and our Lord Jesus Christ are teaching us how to build a relationship with them. Our service to God, when we're in it, we are not alone. I am with you, even until the end of the system of things. Where two or three assemble in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Do we get this feeling? Do we get this sense? Or do we just plump down there and wait for the hour to go home, you see? Or are we sensing a relationship that should be developed in us, in our relationship with our God and our, His Son, Jesus Christ? However, our talk is not whether we trust in God. That's not supposed to be the topic. Rather, our talk is about God trusting us. God reaching out to have a relationship with us. That's what's so amazing. Jehovah does trust us. And why he does trust us, imperfect creatures, boggles the imagination. For we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, according to David. And yet God trusts us because he loves us and his love is trusting. Love reaches out to touch someone. You find affection does this sort of thing, and we ought to learn that. Sometimes some of our brothers get all hooked up because somebody hugs somebody. <laughs> or touches it. I wish to God you don't do that because love is important. Affection and warmth are important. If you want to have a child know that he loves you, you better get him and squeeze him. That's the truth, brother. That's how the warmth comes out of us to someone else, and we know that just the way a hand is shaken or grasped. You can feel the energy, the communication, the feeling coming out of one into another. But if he gives you a fish hand, forget it. <laughs> you, 
You know, there's nothing in that verse that is least of all trust. To be trusting may mean we have to take risks. Because of our imperfections, our attitudes, our urges, our actions are all still somewhat questionable. We can actually go too far. We can actually set aside all self-control. We can take liberty to an extreme. We can boast our heads one day how strong we are and the next day commit a real grievous sin. That's how flip-flop we are. Really. So why should we be trusted? That's what makes our God so beautiful because He trusts us. Perhaps he knows us better than we know ourselves, and that's no doubt he does. Jehovah has set, has such a deep respect and love for us that he trusts us with some awesome responsibility. And it's that love and that trust that moves us, once we get the sense of it, to want to do his will. So let's illustrate it a little bit in a small way. Back in the 30s, a young man wanted to drive a car. All kids like to drive cars. When you get older, you get a little smarter. But the fact of the matter is, when you're a little kid, you get behind a wheel or grab something, and you go, and you think you're driving, and you're sitting still, and we're off, you know. You go through all the motions of an automobile, perhaps even better than your dad would ever know it, you know. And that's the way this kid was. He wasn't even 16 years old at the time. And you can imagine how his mom and Delt felt as when he was watching his father doing all the things. Back in the 30s, they didn't have ship gear or anything like that. They had a clutch. And they had a few things there. And a good car going 30 miles an hour was really racing down the highway. <laughs> And lo and behold, when the kid became 16 years old, he got a driver's license. How he ever got it, nobody knows, but back in those days, it wasn't dangerous to be on the highway as it is now. Driving in New York City, my wife at one time begged me, me to teach her to drive, and I never let her drive in New York City. Lo and behold, I hardly want to drive there myself. It's a, it's a frightful experience. And to teach a kid to drive in New York City is like putting a pistol in his hand. <laughs> but try to prevent it from happening. So one day, this dad saw his son watching him. And so he reached into the pocket and brought out the keys and he said, Here kid, kick it out for a spin. The boy got the hold of the keys. Can you imagine how he felt? He didn't dare show it. But ooh, his heart leaped right into his throat. This is what he wanted to do all the time. No, he said, no, I'm your own. I'm not going to be with you. You're driving. Oh, man. So this kid, he had to really control himself and not run to the car. He just... Like a <laughs> man, go in and open the door with a finesse, slip behind the wheel. But if you could hear his heart, that heart was going faster than the engine ever went, and beating away. And so he said, I better take it easy, drive out of here. And he drove out onto the highway, and mom and dad watched him go. And both of them had their hearts in their throats. Wonder what on earth is going to happen now. Now, if you only knew the dad loved that car more than he did his wife. He pampered it more than he did his wife. And yet for him to give the key to his son, can you imagine what that represented? So lo and behold, the car went down the road and the, the house was out of sight. No more dad, no more mom. You ought to see the crazy things that went into the kid's head. 
mind, this thing can go 100 miles an hour. They didn't even think a car going 100 miles an hour in those days. But uh, he had these ideas. I can drive all the way to Chicago and back, and they would never know the difference. Oh, let me race this thing, you see. The truth of the matter is, he didn't do any of the crazy things that he thought he'd do. Why not? He drove below the speed limit. He held his cool. Why? Because of this personal relationship with his father. His father trusted him. And that is what makes all the difference in the world when you come to appreciate this relationship of trust. The sense of trust, a loving relationship, is what kept him in restraint. Now in the old days, this kid is now an old man. Now he knows how greatly his father is because he has a car, he has children, and now he does not want to give his children this car <laughs> because the car represents a real expense, expenditure. And it's not easy. And the bigger the car, the harder it is to give it away unless you're loaded in the bank and few of us are. So this is something that we've got to think about. Can we feel that relationship when it comes between us and God? That's what we're talking about. A warm, trusting, friendly relationship. So I think if you get that mainly in your prayers and the way you talk, and when you do pray, you can't have other people around you when you do that, because immediately you're concerned about the words you use and what you might say when someone is listening. But when you crawl into your closet and you're all by yourself there, you can pour it out. And you can really talk like you do and should talk to your Father who is in heaven. Pour it out. Both men and women need to do that. There are some things women would like to say about their husbands that they don't. Thank God they don't, you see. <laughs> but when they get into prayer, they can say it. And there are things that husbands like to say, too, that they know better not to. <laughs> and so, but in that closet, they can say it. And they can walk out as if nothing happened. <laughs> That is the truth of the matter. And you kids can do the same thing. You can get into your closet and say, Jehovah, I, what kind of parents do I have? <laughs> and you can say what's in your heart. And Jehovah knows that it's something for you to realize because this is a relationship we're talking about, a friendship. And it's beautiful to have. Experiences like these let us know how God feels about us. This relationship with God is a big thing. We can feel God's great love for us when He entrusts us with responsibility. Responsibility like the good news of the kingdom. Being trusted with a car is peanuts compared to that, really. Because really, the good news of the kingdom means life to the hearers. It is as if it were the DNA process. God has given us the combination of words to teach others that if, when they embrace these words, they get on the road to life. They make a dedication to God. They get baptized. They go into service. And they begin to praise the living God for a relationship that is built within them. It's an awesome but wonderful responsibility. Paul, who persecuted the congregation of God, never dreamt in a million years that God would trust him with anything. Because this man not only persecuted, but held the coats of those who stoned his people and begged them to stone him and looked for them. And yet, God comes and trusts him. Now that is why Paul says, I praise my God, Jehovah. And I glorify my ministry because that's the last thing in the world I could ever imagine. 
could ever happen to me. Now, all of us have things that we can count and when you think about the wages of sin and death and the gift of God and everlasting life, it's not only the wages of the big sin and death, but the wages of the little ones too. And yet God, notwithstanding that, does trust God. And that's something very fine to hear. God placed in Paul's hands the privilege of extending life to those who are here, trusting him with the reaching of the good news of the kingdom. How wonderful Jehovah is to trust us that way. All of us should have this warm, fellow, and affectionate relationship. It's worth it, brothers. It makes preaching all the difference in the world when you have this relationship. Jehovah's purpose that a father and son relationship should exist and that there should be an intimacy between himself and the whole families of the earth. Trust born of love is what binds that intimacy together. It is impossible for God to lie and therefore we're encouraged to place into our brothers of our brothers in prison for neutrality sake. And lo and behold, in some of these nations, these officials have little or absolute no regard for anyone who does not want to go into the military service. And they beat those who will not go mercilessly. One of our brothers was beaten that way. And he said in his heart, he says, I cannot take it any longer. I'm ready to give in, cave in. That night he was sitting on his bunk, and while he was sitting there in the dark, another lad came next to him. And he said, I know what you're thinking. He said, don't give up, he says. I compromise and have not had any peace of mind since then. These few words put into his mind and heart, don't give up. I did it and I'm sorry for it. Made this lad strong, unmovable. So the next day he got the strength and endured it. And lo and behold, he never compromised. And to this day he repeats this experience. He feeds on it. He realizes and he tells us that being a man of integrity gives you not only courage but strength but makes you to endure. And this not only brings glory to God but makes you feel 1,000% beautiful inside. He gives you worth. Tells you your value. That you're worth something. Compromise never does. So Jehovah's Spirit helped him to endure. And to this day, the young lad, who is not so young anymore, tells us about these experiences. Sister Yoon, you listen to her. Harold King, listen to him. These were people put in solitary confinement for days, months, and came out singing Jehovah's praise. Why? The strength that God has given them to endure. And they have endured. They had no room for compromises. I think about Petzinger. He was a beautiful man, endured the concentration camps, Nazi concentration camps. And he and the governing body, when he sat around the table and we were negotiating a thing, Petzinger would say, No, governors, no. There are no small compromises. No small compromises. When you think they're small, they're great. There are no small compromises. Never forgot the man. Beautiful man. Sister Petzinger is still going. Brother Petzinger died. Faithful. Now this revelation of the will of God to save mankind to create a new heavens and a new earth, 
for the for mankind's enjoyment this knowledge to have this as a gift from God to us think of it of all the billions of creatures on the face of the earth we are privileged to know these things and people without this knowledge are empty they're lost to no purpose in life they just flounder around as a blind man or as people with sight and darkness but we who have this light what privilege it is for us to have it these truths give us a reason for living they they're food to enjoy every day of our lives now and forever we want to think of that because Jehovah God has given us this gift and it's a marvelous gift Paul wrote to Timothy he said these words at 2nd Timothy chapter 1 verses 10 to 14 keep holding the pattern of faithful words that you heard from me with faith and love that are in connection with Christ Jesus this fine trust guard through the Holy Spirit which is dwelling in us yes brothers guard this trust don't take it for granted don't let anyone or anything rob us of it this fine trust is a token from Jehovah of his love for us of his confidence in us of his appreciation for our dedication of our lives to him and what a, an encouragement or encouraging statement was that made by Paul we can hardly feel worthy of a statement like that a trust of course is something committed or entrusted to one to be used or cared for in the interest of others now uh, to be trusted with the good news of the kingdom is certainly awesome indeed to be trusted is a greater compliment than to be loved and so we can feel ourselves trusted because we are trusted with the good news now what is this trust Paul calls this trust the pattern of helpful words received from God through the Lord Jesus Christ now these are words of life other translations call them the pattern of sound words or wholesome teachings helpful discourses wholesome instruction but they're words of life just not instruction itself or discourses Paul refers to a pattern or an outline of truth of the good news committed to Timothy as sound Christian doctrine that Timothy was entrusted with and which he was required to transmit to others now these truths Timothy was to fix firmly in mind and heart now he most likely memorized them because there, we can find these words nowhere in the Bible so there's no evidence that these truths were given to Timothy in writing because if, had they been they would have been a part of the canon of the scriptures and since we cannot find them in the scriptures it must have given given to Timothy orally and he memorized them and oh I wish someone would give us that assignment to memorize certain portions of the scriptures oh because we walk away forgetting scriptures and the scriptures are great company to us thoughts of God thoughts of life relationships I find the eighth psalm one of the most beautiful psalms of the Bible Jesus quoted it when he said have you never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise that comes from the eighth psalm 
to still the mouth of the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens and the works of your hands, I say, oh, what is man? He said, you are mindful of him. You have made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with honor and glory and made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have placed all things beneath his feet, all cattle and oxen, the sheep of the field, the fish of the sea, and whatever whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Oh, Jehovah, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings you have perfected praise. Isn't that beautiful? It's out of Psalm. Psalm 8. Lord, when you memorize the scripture, you be walking down. You put these your seven heavens flying away so easy on the face of the earth. But brothers, it might be a little work to you, but you don't know how rewarding it is unless you do it. So, you find when you read the words of Paul to Timothy, there is no doubt committed to Timothy. These are clear, connected views and teachings that are to be preached to others that if Timothy does it, it means life to mankind. Now you want to pause for a moment down here and just look at ourselves here, how calm we are, sit here. Let's look again at that beautiful butterfly and see if we can't learn from it what our trust in Jehovah is like could be. What does that teaching mean to us? If anything, it teaches us to trust in Jehovah for whatever may come our way. It is He who is going to sustain us and not we ourselves. Should persecution come our way, we don't like it, but we can stand it. We will take it. Trust tells us that. If there be hunger, God will feed us. We will not starve to death. If we thirst, we will receive ample provisions. The only thing is, truthfully, when you become a part of Jehovah's organization, you get more than you need. When I look at Jehovah's organization today, especially in New York City, every one of them look a little like I do. Too much. <laughs> Not that they're starving. There's no one. Too many of us are eating too much, doing too little to work it all off. And it's amazing how many people are on diets these days, you know. The truth of the matter is, they should be. <laughs> But, when you read the scriptures, the truth is, five loaves of bread and two fishes, we learn can feed thousands. But there's another lesson. Slavery in Egypt was not easy. It was rough. But there was food. Not much, but some. And because those Jews could see that food, they wanted to go back to Egypt they were off the desert. It was easier to trust in Jehovah when you saw things coming your way than when there was nothing coming your way. To be down there in the wilderness desert under a burning sun with rock and sand everywhere without no sign of visible food or water, that takes trust. That's what tries the heart of men and boys. Will we trust in Jehovah with all our heart? When all these things, these things seem to go desolate on us, when push comes to shove, where will we be? Something to remember, Jehovah does not entrust anyone or everyone with the good news. He just doesn't do it. At First Thessalonians, he makes a phrase there, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He says, Just as we have been proved by God as fit to be entrusted with the good news. Proved by God as fit to be trusted with the good news. So we speak as pleasing 
not men, but God who makes proof of our hearts. God makes proof of our hearts before he entrusts us with the good news. The expression proved by God as fit comes from the Greek expression that means to be recognized as genuine after examination that you have been approved as being worthy. So you're put to the test first. You're proved genuine and then worthy to be entrusted of the good news. And so far we can see that Jehovah has opened the door only to those who are dedicated and baptized as being the ones who have passed that test. And that is why they have been entrusted with the good news of the kingdom pointing the way to, to everlasting life. This trust shows that they are concerned not only with their own salvation, but with the salvation of others. In fact, we want to be trusted. We, in fact, even pummel our bodies and leave them, or leave them as a slave so as, even though we have preached to others, that we somehow will not become disapproved by God. Yes, our desire is to please not men but God and make proof of our hearts, or he who makes proof of our hearts, to gain and retain God's approval, that friendship that he gives to us. An elderly woman, very wonderful woman put feelings to the word she says now in her age she was in the 80s when she wrote this she says the secret of my joy and serenity is that I make the most of my blessings my assets and my joyful moments helping others you get a load of that because so many of us are bent inward but she says, after all of these years, she finds the greatest joy in helping others. I make the most of my opportunities and my talents, my successes preaching to others. The truth sets me free. I try to make the most of everything that comes, my, comes into my life. If good comes my way, I am grateful. If the worst comes along, I accept the challenge and make the most of it. I make the most of what comes and the least of what goes. And I found that this is what makes me happy. Can you learn from this? This dear woman is a true butterfly. The Bible says that we should be fit for the ministry. Now how can we, honest-hearted ones, prove ourselves fit for the ministry. Fitness comes primarily with an attitude of mind, a disposition, how we think and feel and what we do. A certain sister, in order to be of the right frame of mind, what she does, she goes around the house and she puts certain posts or signs here and there to remind her of what sort of person she ought to be. I know we put certain signs on our refrigerator doors, we hang pictures up, but here's, this is what she does. She said she visited the society one time and saw the big sign on one of the buildings that says, read God's Word, the Bible, daily. So that's one of the signs she has. So when she walks around about the house, she sees that sign and she is reminded, did I read the Bible today? And I do think that would be, should be a sign in everyone's home because we find hard to read the Bible daily. Another one is integrity demands that I do what's right, even if it's unpleasant and unpopular. Here is a sister that appreciates it's good to have a sense of integrity to purpose, to value. And so when there are judgments to be made, Going to look at that sign. Then, she, when pain comes into her life, she has a sign for that. Pearls are the product. And as she, she said, she wandered through life. One of the best 
little reminders that she has is from Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 and it doesn't say that exactly but her sign is keep your eyes on the prize over there it says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so those are the things that she uses to remind her of what she should do in life and all of these little things take time to learn brothers but we can learn them if we devote ourselves to some study by means of home Bible studies, people start from knowing nothing to gaining a rounded out understanding of the Word of God. And they become devoted to Him. They develop a friendship with Jehovah and in their dedication they prove true to their promise. Now we shouldn't try to force anybody to do right habits. I do think it was said earlier this this day. I don't know if it was a part of the Watchtower study or not, but the fact is, force is not God's way. We encourage people to do better things and to grow from within. If they approve themselves from within, they will become better people from without. So we invite them to attend the Christian congregation meetings, and it's amazing to see how people are coming into the truth today. Not long ago, we had a little humorous incident happened at Bethel where a sister came right out of a nightclub. I never knew that they talked about these things at nightclubs. But she said around the table they were discussing Jehovah's Witnesses and someone there knew a little bit about Bethel, gave her the address, and after the discussion, she was an entertainer there after the discussion. She got onto a plane, flew into Kennedy Airport, got a taxi, and came to Bethel in her nightclub, nightclub garments. Well, she didn't know what Bethel was, so she thought she was, but when she came in there, she learned very quickly that she was not dressed properly. But we did the best we could with her and hoped for the best, she returned to her hometown, started the study, and fact is she married a pioneer and she herself to this day are pioneering. A couple of years later, she came to Bethel looking like an entirely different person. Isn't that something? What a change. If we were to turn her away, what would we be? And uh, a young lady came into Bethel she came into the lobby, and her first question was, she looked around, she says, am I properly dressed? You see, they get the sense of their being in a different place. And so the brother said, yes, you're properly dressed for the lobby, because it's public. But you won't be taken on tour, or taken to a new meal. You've got to dress differently for that. And so she went home. She was not offended. The beautiful thing, she came back later, later, did take a tour, and was invited to dinner. Another girl wanting to come to Bethel, I don't know where, what we teach these kids, really, because this girl put on a dress that had a slit in it, you know, one of these from here to eternity. <laughs> and, but she felt uncomfortable even in at home, and so she went to her mother. She had that much common sense. She says, Mom, is this all right? And the mom says, why don't you just take the scissors and where the slit begins, cut, and then see what you think. Oh, she says, that would be a bit much, wouldn't it? She says, now you're learning. She says, you've got a wardrobe of things to wear. Why don't you go in there and pick something of the Easter play and dress that way? And now it is not only the girls that are needing to be talk things like this. Even our dear brothers. One brother, oh my goodness gracious, he got more deodorants and soaps and everything else, but never did anyone tell him what was the problem. <laughs> the problem was he came from Europe where they don't, now they do more than that, but a few years ago they used to take baths more often. But lo and behold, sometimes people are not 
even doing that, and they need to be told. And that's a very sensitive subject to address. But the brothers said, I wish they had told me. I got enough spoke. He just didn't know what to do with it. That's all. <laughs> so some people need to be told. And as we study with the new ones, we find that their faith increases, they change their lifestyles, and they become very much involved in the Word of God. So that's a good thing, because as we read what Romans 12, 2 tells us, quit being fashioned after the system of things, but be transformed by making your mind over that you may prove to yourselves what is the good and perfect will of God. And when you talk to people who are trying to make these adjustments in life, use kind words. Kind words can be short and easy to speak, but their echoes are truly endless. And the fruitage of God's Spirit is kindness. So you want to be very kind to people when you speak to them. When your Bible studies are made, have made sufficient progress, they may want to become a non-baptized publisher. As they go along, the elders will talk to them. They may even want to be baptized, so they're talked to see if they're ready for baptism. And when they are baptized, there certainly is great joy. Mothers and fathers are happy. Other family members are made happy. The congregation is happy. Those who have been involved in teaching with them are made happy. And today, when we had our baptismal service today, would you believe there were 13 baptized today here? And how marvelous. And there were nine yesterday. So, fine group of young people coming into the truth and dedicating their lives to God. Every time I think about baptism, I think about this circuit overseer who was in the congregation talking about baptism. And he says, I've got a question. Can anyone tell me why John the Baptist hesitated to baptize Jesus? Nobody wanted to raise that. And then the little kid raised his hand. So the circuit overseer said, Great boy, what do you think was the reason? Well, he says, maybe it was because John wasn't sure whether Jesus could answer the 80 questions. <laughs> The <laughs> baptism, brothers, is just the beginning. And it's a marvelous beginning if we really do apply ourselves. And we want to all that we have to be able to carry on and make the necessary changes in life and do work that is pleasing to our God, Jehovah. And all we do, brothers, reach out to grow. If you're auxiliary pioneer, try to become a regular one. If you have a lot of energy in you and you're young and you want to apply your life, see if you can come to Bethel and we'll put all that energy to work. If you're a married man with skills and you think you're out of the range of doing things like that, did you ever think about going into the international field. We are renovating branches and we're building new ones and assembly halls around the world. We need skills, carpentry skills, electrical skills, all kinds of skills are needed. What a job. You can become an international servant or an international volunteer. You can give your wife a change of scenery. She'll give you a piece of her mind. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there is a whole world out there to be lived and to be enjoyed and you want to be able to do that brothers but whatever you do be faithful be courageous living with one another be kind be worthy of the trust that God has entrusted you with and may this beauteous God of ours. We call him beauteous because Isaiah calls him beauteous. 
Why? Why not beautiful? He is beautiful. But the word beauteous, if you ever look it up, it's the embodiment of all that is beautiful. All that is beautiful is embodied in God. And so this beautiful servant of Isaiah said, Our beauteous God, may this beauteous God of ours bless each and every one of you richly. Thank you, brother.